So I was going to decide that we are going to start, and um, Michael, if someone on that, you know, he's going to introduce you today. Uh, we go on, we have to do it some um, constraints of time, but uh, enjoy the show. Go ahead. Good afternoon to you all. It is a pleasure to present uh, Lewis Gordon uh, in the scope of the Cathedral of Ubuntu de Sousa Sanche, and I'm here representing the director of the Faculty of Economics, in her uh, regards. And uh, uh, Lewis Gordon is well known, but today we are special because we will have a talk, 30 minutes, and then a uh, concert by, that I will present in a few minutes. Uh, so today, um, we will going to be talking about shifting the geography of reasons. It will be the, the matter of his talk, and uh, he is uh, he uh, is a, a Jewish Afro Afro Jewish philosopher, very well known. Uh, also a musician, a musician that was born in Jamaica and grew up in or in Bronx. He produced a lot of books, read, uh, has written a lot of books, and but his most known book. That's, it's, <laughs> it's what Fanon said, a philosophical introduction to his life and thought. After his presentation, his talk, we'll have a concert by the band uh, Three Generations, uh, they are called, they, they say they represent uh, Generation Z, Elijah Gordon, also your son, uh, Generation Y by Gregor, a PhD student of Gordon, and finally, Lewis Gordon. Uh, he's a baby boomer, born <laughs> as me, as me, he was born in 62, I was born in 63. And it's a baby boomer for the United States because in Portugal we were in a fascist, colonial war and we were a very poor country. And I was born not in Portugal, mainland, but in the Azores. Even more poor, poorer than the mainland. We have only TV after 75. Uh, <laughs> we didn't see the TV. So, uh, after this presentation, and you are waiting for him to talk and to see the, uh, the show, uh, so it's a great pleasure, Gordon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. and bon dia, and uh, shalom, salam alaikum. And, uh, wow, It'll soon be sunset, and Jews will say Shabbat Shalom. Uh, I see your island bag. Those are not from Jamaica. Little island bag. Uh, thank you all for your generosity. Uh, I've had a wonderful few days here. It's my second time in Coimbra, and at a ball the last time. And this time, not only have I been spending a lot of time with wonderful people. Every conversation has been too short, even when we go in on for hours, that, which is a sign, because as you know, if they're terrible conversations, two minutes is forever. And so I, it's been wonderful, the food, everything. And to connect it to that also, I'm so delighted that we're honoring uh, my good friend and comrade, Boa Ventura de Sousa Santos. Uh, in honoring um, Boa, because Boa is not about Boa, Boa is about the world, the community. And so in honoring him, we're really honoring many others. So I thank you all for that. So I will begin. Um, in the l seminar I gave earlier this week, I talked about a few things. But today, I'm only going to talk about three things that I hope would be useful. And to understand those three things, you could wonder, why do I ask that this year? Okay? Well, I'll start off with some sounds. Let me just open this since it's easier to drink it. So I start with. Did you get that? And you may ask, what was that? Well, musicians would hear it as two bars of seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. You, you've heard that, right? Now here's the curious thing. Seven can be understood in many ways. 
7 could be 4 and 3. Did you count it? 7 can be 5 and 2. Seven could be six and one. Now, you saw my hands tap the same way each time. Did you hear something different? You did. It's strange, isn't it? Because object, we are, Many of us here are professors and students. If you're a professor or a student, you always hear that dreaded word, objectivity. <laughs> but this is objectivity. This is objective. Right? Yet collectively, when I said four and three, five and two, they're all seven. But we hear collectively different things when we say four and three, <coughs> five and two, six and one. And that should tell you something. Because it, the reason we can hear it is because we are all human beings. We belong to the human world. And that means that together, when we do this, if I told you ahead, some people would say, well, do I belong to the human world? But because I played it first, you can hear it, and it becomes evidential. And this should tell you something about knowledge, but it also could tell you something about art. Because what I just did with the tapping is something very technical in philosophy. It's called a transcendental argument. It's what Immanuel Kant argued. I know Kant is a scary word. <laughs> because what I show is that we share categories of understanding, but the mistake Kant made, and a lot of what my writing is about, is that he only focused on that question of understanding. Even when he looked at nature and beauty, it was about understanding. However, we share also categories of feeling. We share categories of rhythm, dance, pleasure, suffering. We share them, OK? And so the first thing I would like to do is announce straightforwardly that I don't take the position that many theorists and philosophers take towards art, aesthetics. Most people, as you know, take the position that the important issues are either scientific, political, or moral. And if you take care of those, then maybe Maybe you have some time for art. Or maybe you have some time for pleasure, for food. Things like that. And I reject that. I argue that those are false dilemmas. That ultimately, and many of you who were at my talk on Wednesday heard this, I take the position that human beings need to live in worlds of meaning. And you take aesthetics, art, poetry, taste of food, decoration, all these things out of the human world, and you create a world in which you could put a human being, but it's not a world in which a human <coughs> being can live. So art the way I interpret it, is to produce a world that we can live in. And this is tricky because remember I said on Wednesday that every one of us knows something that is very difficult to accept. And that is the universe 
would have been perfectly fine without us. That's the thing. It's a scary thought. Um, my son is going to join us um, in the next part. But I remember um, my, my wife and I, we have a family of four children, six of us total. And I remembered when our youngest, who was the one who's going to play, uh, when he could speak and we were all taking out pictures, we looked at the picture. We used to call him Papi. Okay, so we took out the pictures and we're showing pictures of the family and traveling and so forth. And he looked at the pictures and he noticed a great injustice. He wasn't there. <laughs> he was, he said, where's Mr. Poppy? <laughs> and, and you know why it was such an outrage? Because we had the nerve in those pictures to be happy. How could we be happy before he existed? <laughs> If you think about it, that summarizes the Bible, everything, all of human, if human, a lot of human literature is about trying to convince ourselves that God was so unhappy <laughs> until God made us. The problem is, you all know the truth. Every myth, every society has the same story. Things were pretty cool when we weren't around. Then God made us, and before you know it, there's the first disobedience. There's and eventually the first murder, the first, you know, we come up, and we with our free will start messing things up, okay? And so we try to figure this out, and many rationalizations lead to certain views of reason. So the talk is called Shifting the Geography of Reason. It's the motto of the Caribbean Philosophical Association. And the story is, I was writing about this concept in the 90s. And when we had our first meeting of the Caribbean Philosophical Association, we thought we should explore the issue as a community. It's just that we realized after the first meeting, we need to explore it more. And before you know it, it's more than a decade later, and every meeting became shifting the geography of reason with a subtitle. What led to this idea about shifting the geography of reason was I noticed something in the Caribbean, and we talked about it. And what I noticed is something you've, you've seen before the Caribbean, and it's something you've seen here in Portugal before Portugal went to the seas. And it's something people have seen in Italy and people have seen in, in you know, in place in Greece and they've seen in Egypt. And what that is, is if you look at a lot of imperial history, every empire shows up and beats its chest and says, we are the end of history. We are <laughs> what everything will be. Huh? And so they announce it. And of course, what happens is they beat their chests and they say, everything, everybody must become us. And then eventually, people find other ways to live. And the truth, just like the universe could exist without us, the truth is humanity can exist without empires. But the problem is when people live in empires, they think the fall of their empire is the end of the world. You can imagine how, how difficult, given my position, it is to live in the United States. Yes. <laughs> because in the United States, the belief is that without the United States ruling the world, it's the end of the world. But we know you know, the, Brits, the, Brit, the people in Britain haven't figured it out yet. They still think they are an emperor. <laughs> so they're thinking, you know, but the truth is, 
you know, and the, but the Dutch, a lot of people today, they're saying, the Dutch had an empire? <laughs> yeah, the Dutch, in fact, a lot of the slave trade was from the Dutch. There's a reason there's a New Zealand, from the Dutch. The Danes had an empire. The Danes? The Danes. But what, of course, and this, you go to the Spanish, uh, you go to Portuguese, or what, what the rest of the world knows is that there is life after empire. Right? Right? But there, some people don't accept it. There's still people, as we know, in the Arab world talk about caliphates. But there are also people, it, it, after a while it gets wacky. Could you imagine someone saying, we need the pharaohs? You know? And we could go back, you know, all the way. But the fact is, there is something to bear in mind. Everywhere there is empire, there are people fighting against empire. And empires end up learning more and get transformed from the very people they think they dominate. And each empire, in an effort to build itself, is premised upon something that fuels it. You know, if we think in terms of the, the trades in salt or in or olive oil, how that created empires in the Mediterranean. And then from olive oil, before you know, there's some where it, other <coughs> sources of oil like whale oil. Uh, what became crucial for the British was the notion of the high seas. And before you know it, there, you know, there's oil, there's technology. Every empire has something that links up people whether they like it or not. And in the midst of that, when they fall, often the people at the bottom, because to survive, they had to figure out what they've lost, but they've also had to figure out a way to exist that connects to things that were denied to them. So there's a creativity in many dominated peoples that have the clue to something different. Right now, we're in a period, for instance, of global financial capital. And global financial capital, imagine, that it can open doors for itself as they make our planet smaller and there are just more people. We live in a smaller and a more technologically fast planet. But what global capital doesn't under, fails to understand, or rather, is if you open a door for you, no door moves in one direction. <coughs> In other words, the reason we have crises of immigration, refugee crisis, etc., is, is connected to something really stupid. The presumption that doors should only move one way. But if we make life terrible for people when we open doors to go where they are, it stands to follow they will come in. And this flow of people that is connected to something that is not properly being addressed. And it's not properly being addressed because the people who want to take over the image of the global are those who are imperial and dominate finance, financial capital, etc. However, there could be a different kind of global. A different kind of global is a lot like when I was tapping. Because the, when we listened, we listened as the room. And that's an important metaphor because you were forced by gunpoint or anything like that to listen. <coughs> we participated together, and that is a metaphor of what <coughs> democratic participation could be. It is striking when we are told there's only one way to do things. For instance, there are many important concepts that we think of in one way. When we think of modern, for instance, many people think modern and European are the same thing. And often when people talk about the modern, 
they rarely ever define it. Many people would look at you know, the word modus, which means present, and they will talk about 19th century concepts of the modern. But what's strange is, if the modern is a 19th century concept, why then do we read 18th century European philosophers as modern? We read, or 17th century, we read Descartes, we go all the way through Spinoza, we go through all the way, you know, Kant, Hume. Those are, but why are they modern when the concept of formulating it was 19th century? Well, the short answer to that is that other things joined the modern, and actually, it's not that they are modern, it's that they are what we call Euro modern. And here's what I mean. For something to be modern, all it has to be is in order to say you belong to the present, it means you are the direction in which the future is headed. OK? Because the problem with the present, you all know this, right? When you try to catch your present, it's already passed. So for you to catch your present, you have to anticipate your present, which means there's a future. So that future coming in, literally to be modern, really means to belong to the future. But this is where it gets tricky. Because what Euro-modern did is to say only one group of people belong to the future. All the other people in the rest of the world, you know, they were just minding their own business. And they expected their future. Whether you're Amerindian, whether you're Koza in Southern Africa, whether you're a Trinidian, wherever you are, you're just living your life expecting to belong to your future. But then a group came along and said, you don't have a future. And when you're told you have no future, it means you belong to the past. And a, a philosophical anthropology came with that. And it created stuff. It created race and racism. But it also created something that people didn't see before. It created the notion of primitive people. In fact, that's what it means, you know, prima first from the past. And this notion of primitive people and modern people as only those who belong to the future, and that created something new because you see, past empires had a view that you could create hybrids of belonging. And it's that created, that's why you could go from, for instance, the ancient Roman Empire to the Holy Roman Empire. But this empire is something new. No matter how much you could speak the language, walk the walk, talk the talk, as they say, no matter how much you can imitate those who have colonized you, you're always told, by virtue of race, that you don't belong to the future. And this created several unique kinds of invisibility. And so I'm just going to talk about those briefly, and I'm going to conclude with something I promised to talk about, which is something we need to think about if we're going to respond to the hierarchical imposition of one kind of people. The short version, and I'm going to keep it short, uh, is that once you have this notion of time, that's linked to identity and belonging. It creates that the mistake many people make is methodologically, they want to analyze these things exclusively in terms of one concept. So some people want to look at it economically, some want to look at it psychologically, some want to look at it biologically, etc. And in my book, Disciplinary Decadence, I argue against those. Even as you see me give this talk, you notice it's mixed with ways of doing things. 
and not for the sake of entertainment, because I've demonstrated that you can tap a transcendental argument. Well, one problem with the way we look at human phenomena is we tend to want to find simply one thing. So what I'm going to do is, uh, is offer four dimensions. But bear in mind that there are many more than four. Okay? And these are four dimensions of invisibility in the context of Euro-modernity. So the first, invisibility by virtue of quantity. And that is some, this is, when I say that, I mean race. See, people are used to talking about race moralistically, etc. But they don't really think about what happens with race as a particular judgment. And here's an example. When people are determined to be racially inferior in a world that says you're struggling to belong to the future, it means that there are always too many of certain kinds of people. One of the big signifiers of that is black people. Now, you may say, what do I mean? Well, in the United States, this may shock you. I taught for a, a while at a university called Temple University. And Temple University, even I heard that it was a black university. Now, it turns out it was called a black university because the number of blacks there were at the t approximately 12%. In other words, it turns out in the United States, if you have blacks at, that exceed 4%, you're called a black university. Uh, and if you think about how people think of diversity, they often say, we have diversity, we got a black person. Uh, one of my experiences of this was one time I taught at a university in the Midwest, and there were 3,500 faculty members, 3,500. 14 were black, okay? The other 13 black faculty would park their cars by where they teach, go to their car and drive home. But I am a fearless ethnographer. And by that I mean I'm willing to go and get embedded so I scheduled my classes on opposite sides of the campus so I could walk and say hi to students, <laughs> people. And as I walked, within a few weeks, the student papers began to complain about affirmative action, about so many black faculty being hired and, I was, and as I saw these papers, I wondered, you know, when I'm walking, I don't see any other black faculty. So I realized, when, they, when I'm walking and they see me, I realized, I am the black faculty. <laughs> <laughs> and to make matters worse, when I finished teaching, and I, by the way, some of you look at my feet because I don't speak my shoes. As I'm walking back, you know what that means? In one day, they saw two black faculty. <laughs> you see what I'm getting at? If you're, if you, it, it's a theodicy. If you're not supposed to be there, then there are always too many of you there. Now, again, everything I'm going to say here doesn't a, a pertain exclusively to one group of people. It's just that in different periods, it's around one group of people more. Okay. For instance, obviously, in places where they say women don't belong, to see one woman is to say too, see too many women. Okay? It's just that in Euro modernity, the quantity issue became obsessed with race. That's why there are always too many black women having babies. There are always too many black immigrants. You know, in the United States, like, what's bizarre is uh, when, when we have to do demographics, 
uh, about our home. We had, a, we had a, um, a technician come in and he had to put figures. If a family member says white, that person is not asked, where did you come from? If you say black, they need to show what country you come from, which means by definition, you could be born in the United States a black person. On that statistic, you are by definition someone who is foreign, you see? Whereas you could be a recent white immigrant. You may even not be a citizen. If you list white, you belong. So that's the quantity. And you already know this. You read the papers, there, there could be many flows, there, you know, to me blacks. The second one is, in, is rather interesting. The second one is not about quantity. It is about time. And what I mean by that is, remember when I said the primitive? Well, if you do not belong in the future, that means you don't belong in the present. Which means then, if you're indigenous, right, and, and there are settlers, the settler has already made up his or her mind that the future is the settler's future. So the problem is, if you're indigenous and you're still around, what do you call something that belongs to the past but is circulating in the present? A ghost. <laughs> a, yeah, a ghost. Now this is crucial. Because, you see, what's in, if you look at many discussions of indigenous peoples, what is imposed on them is almost always the language of the spiritual. It's not to say there isn't spirituality in indigenous communities, but to make an essence of the spiritual is precisely because the idea is that as indigenous, you haunt, like a ghost, the present. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the reasons why indigenous people try uh, to articulate a language about how to make sense of the fact that what their project is, is not to belong to the past, is to, it, and it's not to belong in the settler's term, because that would reinforce belonging to the past. It is to have a different way of thinking and speaking that would make sense given the reality of colonization. And many would use the language of invasion, the future they're building. The third is unique to Europe and Northern Asia but it comes into Euro-modernity. And this one is unique because you notice the first one was race, the second one was unindigenous, the third one is peculiarly gendered. And it is, it is the form of invisibility of not having a voice. Now, you may wonder what I mean at first. All I could do, because I'm, I'm making this short, but we could correspond about it, but all you gotta do is look at a lot of women's literature in Europe, in East Asia, and in the colonies that are connected to Europe. Many women's writings have the word, find a voice in them. Black women writers, a voice from the South, you will hear in her own voice, fighting for a voice. There are a collection of Chinese women writings in their voice. Why so much about a voice? And there are myths on this too. If you look at some of the myths, for instance, around Theseus, his wife, she, oh, I'm sorry, um, the, often women come out of experiences and they have no, they're silent. Well, the short answer I have for that, is because voice is linked to <coughs> politics. And that's what I'm going to conclude it with. But, and that is, politics 
requires the power, the power of speech. And so if you're in a society that says women are not to be part of the political world, then women must be without a voice. And here's the complicated thing. It's not to say women don't make sounds, don't speak languages. But what is powerful about speech is that speech can only transform into power if others listen. <coughs> so in a society where you're not to listen to a woman speak, then she is, in effect, voiceless. And this is crucial because many of you who study political philosophy know, and it goes all the way back not only to ancient Athens, but all the way back also to ancient Egyptian societies, that the only way you can be political is to speak. And but what's crucial is if you look at ancient, um, among the ancient Athenians, the word for the non-political person was idiotes. Yes, idiot. And what's interesting is, even in the ancient Egyptian, in the language of Metuneter, just to give you a sense, because you see, we always presume that Europeans are the ones who created our concepts. But there, I was showing my other lecture, a lot of concepts that we have in European languages have origins in African languages. And here's one, because in Meluneter, there was a concept called idi, from which you get idiotis. And idi means deaf. Yeah, it means not to hear. So you could see the connection. And because for the ancient Athenians, if, if you're not heard, you're private, you're not public. And so if one is going to transform we could see again, remember I said it's not exclusive, it's just it's more on women. But if you're black and nobody's to listen to you, you see the, the logic. If you're, if you're brown, but you don't belong to the future, you see the connection to the indigenous argument. So all of these claims are about connections. But the whole point of colonization and the whole point about what happened with Euro-modernity is about systematic disempowerment of quantity, temporality, of voice. And I come to the last one because it's connected to Sej. If nobody, if there's too many of you, you don't belong to the future and nobody would listen to you, then it means you are not at all a valued as a source of knowledge. Your knowledge is invisible. Do you see it? It closes off what you offer, what you learn. Even though you are paying attention to the circumstances around you. <coughs> and so in effect, one would have to transform, bring humility into the, into the world of how we produce knowledge for those to appear. And so I come to the concluding part. Because I've already hinted at it when I said disempowerment. We live in a very strange period right now in which many people, particularly on the left, the right has no problem with this, but the left does. Too many people on the left are allergic to power. They are, they're, yeah. You see, and this is connected to something very ominous. Because, you see, the right, in their history from Hobbes and all that, they have no problem with coercive power. And so, th the negative view of power, they embrace. But the problem is, many of us have left that conception of power to dominate and have not really interrogated power the way, for instance, I interrogated theory the other day, or I would argue to interrogate modern, you see? And part of this is a situation in which the fetishizing of how to talk about issues dominate. 
So for instance, if you say power today, people automatically say, oh, Foucault? <laughs> <laughs> or if they think they're going to be a little more historical, they say, no, 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 Nietzsche. And you see, those are names, but that's not talking about power. And the thing to know about power, that's crucial to know about power, is if you had no power, you could not get out of bed this morning. If there were no power, you wouldn't, even if you got out of bed, made it here, because actually power is a function of the human world. And so let me offer a brief definition of power, and then I will close, okay? <coughs> There's a reason the, a positive understanding of power is bullied away from us. It makes us more vulnerable to the negative one. But power, very simply defined, is the ability to make things happen with access to the means of doing so. Simple as that. You are a, with a lot of things that we could make happen today is because human beings created a world in which, it, by virtue of being a social world, we can actually have things happen without being in the location of where it happens. If, I, if there were no power, I would just be locked at my physical body. But because we have a social world, culture, art, music, I don't have to be next to you to reach you because I have speech. This has been recorded, so there are people none of us would ever meet that these conversations would affect. Their power is such that there are people who could be in Washington, D.C., <laughs> making decisions that affect people who are living in Accra or people who are living in Khartoum. And in fact, the technologies of power make us, we could be on this planet and we're affecting things in the outer side of our solar system. Now, by itself, that's just an ability. And what's strange is there's such a fear of dealing with that <coughs> positive ability, in other words, not only the ability to make things happen, but another ability is the ability to increase other people's ability to make things happen. That's called, among one of the techniques we have, you know, is one called education. If many of you are educated, you're empowered to make things happen. If you're miseducated, you may have the certification, but lack the capacity. And in fact, there are many people who know this. The economist, the liberal economist, Amartya Zen, he knows this. But the problem is in liberalism, liberalism is afraid of talking about empowering the people. So he had to sugarcoat it. <coughs> so Amartya Zen didn't say, you know, I am writing about power. He says, I am writing about capabilities. And then Martha Nussbaum comes in and she says, yes, capabilities in development. What the hell is a capability but having an ability to make things happen? It's power. However, it becomes dangerous for those who are trying to build a different future, a, a future that's a better one for humanity, to abdicate, to give up, to let go of power. Because it means that you will only leave power in the hands of coercive power, those who want to block people from empowerment. And when I say this, I'm going to close by just simply saying, you know, the word power itself is something people have been reflecting on for thousands of years. Not only we were shocked that the gods didn't have to create us, but we also were curious about this phenomenon. When you hear the word power, etymologically, people say, oh, it comes from potent. All right, like in Latin, right? The potent, potency. You think about, 
you know, omnipotence, God, all-powerful God. And in fact, when you think about power with gods, it gives you a clue to power because a lot of our institutions we have created are prosthetic gods. They're reflections of God. Because think about it. If God, all her mighty, we could have, you know, she could come or he, but if God came in and God said, I said, God, come over here. And you're like, it's God. <laughs> and God came, and we don't want to be um, prejudicial here, so we're not going to do the stereotype because people like to think of God with a booming voice. Say, so, you know, say, come over here, God. And God says, okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's the first thing every one of you would say if I brought God over? And God said, okay, here I am. What's the first thing every one of you will ask? You ask, you say, you're God? Yes, I am. <laughs> the first thing you will all ask God to do is do something. <laughs> if God says, can't. <laughs> so what do you mean you can't? You're God. Can't do it. It's all good. God of you. But you see the whole point. God must have ability. And the language that that word potent is a transformation of is the same African language I referred to earlier. Because the word that was used in that language, metuneta, was pute, from which you get potent. And what is pute? It's the same root from which you get the word pharaoh. But here's the crucial thing. But they, when it's defined, in that language, there are many words for power, but you cannot have but they without another thing called heka. It's from which you get the word hex, like magic. In other words, we have methodologically tend to want to find a single element to how something works. But what people understood in the past, and many people in other parts of the world know today, is that we live in a world of things having to be put together for things to work. You see what I'm saying? And so even though there may be a pharaoh or a pate, that person needs heka. And the crucial word in heka is ka. And what ka means is a, it has many meanings. But it means the womb. It means life. It means the force that makes things work. You see where I'm going with this? In fact, a lot of people don't know the word Africa is an African word. It means to come from the womb, from the source of humanity. And so this idea that even a king or a queen, it's not, I don't like the word king and queen to these ancient people. That's not what they saw. But whoever is supposed to be powerful, it's not that he or she is powerful in his or herself. You see what I'm getting at? It's that ha, which, we, by the way, is the root of the words like in Hebrew, chai, which means life. It's that which brings life to things. It's the ability to make things, make things happen. And this is crucial because it's relational. So if we look at the world we're in today, if we begin to think through different kind of power, Right? The kind of power in which humanity begins to rally its ability to make things happen. Then we could understand that we can rally our forces in a positive sense to do something about the forces of disempowerment today. And it's up to us to do it. Us. Because... Just as the universe could have been fine without us, <coughs> you already know it's coming, so could be our planet. Thank you. <laughs>